In 2016, she became the first female and British director of Tate Modern, which is quite incredible. Um, what did I tell you about this audience? <laughs> they're, they're unruly, but they're enthusiastic. Okay. Under her leadership, Tate Modern became the UK's most visited tourist attraction, at least as of three years ago. I don't know how many of you knew that, but it's quite an astounding fact. Uh, as you can see just now by her actually shepherding you back to the tent, uh, <laughs> Frances is not someone who is, uh, she doesn't stand on ceremony. And that said, being state schooled and a champion of diversity, she has never been afraid to shake things up. Um, so it began with a groundbreaking rehang of the Tate's permanent collection when the museum moved to the Turbine Building in 2000, where she grouped art by theme rather than by historical period. And since then, that practice has been imitated the world over. So I'm excited to moderate the session because when I first met Frances and invited her to EA Festival, I said, let's tackle the most thorny, difficult questions that are confronting art museums today. So. To begin, no, but we're going to have fun, of course. That's, like, that's the number one imperative for today. So not that this is a, this is a question that's L-I-T-E, light. So Francis, what are the biggest challenges that museum directors are facing these days? Well, first, the audience is like this. <laughs> Just going to be super critical. Um, no, uh, well, uh, COVID. OK. Uh, we think we're out of it. We're deeply in it. Massive, uh, catastrophic. Uh, impact on our system. Um, I think we're in trauma uh, as a society, but certainly as an institution, so COVID is one. I think uh, climate, climate emergency is huge. Uh, look at the temperature in Spain today. Spain isn't very far from us. Um, we've been sleepwalking for several decades, so climate is hugely to the fore in my thinking. And I mean, climate emergency and its intersection with all sorts of planetary and people emergencies. Um, and then connected to that, but uh, we talk about it entirely separately, is diversity. And I suppose this is an example. Uh, it's fantastic to be here this afternoon, but this is the least diverse audience of any audience I've talked to uh, on Zoom, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, as a public space uh, with significant government funding, I'm all the time aware of who... What do, who, is, you know, who is my audience? Who is the audience? Who, uh, who owns the institution? Who do we respond to? Where is our duty? Um, and uh, in, with a demographic in London that is now almost 50-50, uh, you know, white, British and BAME, uh, it is no longer possible to uh, look at our audience or indeed look at our staff and think we're doing a good job. So those three things. Okay. And it's a tsunami. It's a big one. Okay, so let's start with COVID because I think that COVID gave rise to a lot of challenges to art museums, among them business models. Obviously, visitor numbers fell, they, they basically vanished. Did you have to undergo a rethink, a retooling? How did the Tate how did Tate actually adapt to that? Um, so how, tell, well, tell us about that. And first of all, COVID for us meant 300 days of closure. So almost a year with the doors closed. And we are uh, a business, uh, we're also a charity, that 60% uh, of our income is driven by our activities. So when the doors close, there is no activity. Uh, we have reserves, and we lived off our reserves and some government support, but we are now absolutely stony broke, as they say. And I walk down Stony Street every morning uh, from London Bridge Tube, and I am always aware, as I arrive to work, um, in a relentless, relentlessly, pover um, a relentlessly poverty, sorry, a relentless, relentlessly positive frame of mind that poverty is the reality of the situation at the moment. So really major uh, cash problems. But the other thing about COVID was that it created this sort of amazing moment of self-reflection. And actually, the, the one gift it gave, it gave time. The world stopped. And uh, I called it uh, internally a year of asking questions. And amazing questions. And uh, questions and time around the doubt that uh, people like me in the institution have been feeling for a long time. Our business model, our business model enshrined in the blockbuster 
um, resources uh, always going to a kind of central type of activity that does not necessarily serve our audiences in the best way, that doesn't necessarily help build diversity, that doesn't necessarily speak to kind of the incredible multidisciplinarity and, and energy of contemporary art. So we had a year of thinking about who we are, what we want to be, how we might change our behaviours, our systems, our processes. But of course, and, and, and left, came out of COVID with all the idealism that we've all read in all the papers around build back better. But actually build back better isn't so easy because you know, we have our default behaviours, our default values. I mean, how many of you in this room have ever really changed your mind fundamentally about anything? <laughs> well, I'd love to hit, fantastic. Not a majority though. A sprinkling of people who understand what, what you know, ch change might look like. So, so I have a sense of the direction of travel that I would like Tate Modern and Tate to pursue, but creating the conditions for that direction of travel to have some traction is going to be very challenging. But it has to happen. I mean, it, it is uh, see, it's, it's a survival mechanism, and sustainability in the broader sense for cultural organisations and culture, you think of culture as the kind of ecosystem of uh, you know, social and economic and political and cultural life, there needs to be shifts. So um, are you saying that without the blockbuster model, it would be very difficult for, a, for Tate to be financially viable? Yes. But, okay. Yes. I'll tell you why, if you like. Yeah, no. Um, very, so 40, yeah. about 41% of our funding comes from the government. Before COVID, it was around 35%. But of course, we're earning less income, so it's a bigger proportion. Um, we have an unbelievably strong membership base. And I, I'm sure, thank you, some of your members, we completely adore you. You're incredibly important. I think 16% of our income comes from membership. Um, a smaller proportion comes from about 11% from ticket sales admissions so that's the you know the people buy tickets for, for ticketed exhibitions because admission is, itself is free around the same amount comes from sponsorship and donations and then there's a sort of 16 percent that comes from our own trading income but our trading income our membership our ticket sales and our sponsorship are all essentially dependent on the blockbuster all the corporates want to put their names against Picasso, Van Gogh, uh, Louise Bourgeois. Membership is driven, we know, by members, not, not entirely, but principally it's a kind of uh, transactional arrangement that you, your membership brings you free entry to as many shows. And then we also know that trading in our cafes and restaurants and uh, bookstores is like this in terms of you know, blockbuster exhibition, non-blockbuster exhibition. So that within the institution, there's, and outside the curatorial teams, there's, uh, the, the, the pressure is on to keep the system afloat through the blockbuster. So, but, but in all other aspects of what we value about a museum, you know, a, a engagement with art and ideas, uh, social engagement, collaboration, uh, participation, uh, exploring new horizons, uh, traveling, mind traveling, breaking with one's, you know, expectations, all those incredibly valuable things are not met by blockbuster exhibitions and are, I think, supported by about 1% of our funding cake. And it just seems to me such an incredibly important thing to address that balance. You know, for people, uh, for art, for sustainability, for the world, for our future. Because there's diminishing returns in always returning to the same artists, for example. We have to expand. I mean, literature has done such an amazing job. Publishing has been so incredibly um, adventurous and expansive. And even just the, the books that, and material we've been discussing here today. And we have to do that in the Art Museum as well. Now, I want to ask also because you have been um, a veter you're a veteran of the museum industry, 
How does this compare with the challenges of 20 years ago? When Was it still dominated by blockbusters? Has the landscape of viability changed since then? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. I mean, 20 years ago, what, what the really significant thing is that the public purse has been getting... Smaller and smaller. smaller and smaller. And when I first joined Tate in at the end of the 80s as a very uh, uh, a rookie curator, we were pretty much fully funded. Uh, wow. We didn't have a development office. We had a, a handful of patrons, uh, amazing supporters of Tate, and doing uh, enabling us and pushing us to get to the 20th century a little bit earlier than others might get to it. They, they forced our hand with the Turner Prize. They helped us set up a, a patron's, a, a new art room for um, commissioning. But essentially, we were a governmental body uh, with, with full funding and with a great deal of money to spend on acquisitions. And during the 80s, uh, under Sir Alan Burness as director, we bought incredible work. I mean, really astonishing, stellar, surrealist masterpieces. And then, uh, I suppose, you know, through the, uh, the, the neoliberal era... Uh, meant a shift from uh, public funding to enterprise. And it wasn't all bad, actually. That idea that you've got, you've got to be hungry uh, fueled a, a, a wonderful, amazing development at Tate. You know, two new Tates in the regions, Tate St. Ives, Tate Liverpool, and then, of course, the whole of Tate Modern. And none of that, I think, would have happened had we been a kind of... Um, uh, government funded a governmental, because it because it also you know it did lead to a sense of sort of uh, complacency or, or satisfaction that with the world, and there's nothing like a little bit of dissatisfaction to drive change. But I think you know so so when we opened Tate Modern in 2000, there was there was just a happier balance, and it was also at a point where uh, we were still you know pre 2008. You could, you could raise a lot of money. And when, what the job I did before I became the director of Tate Modern was I was the director of the collection, uh, international collection. And on the back of opening Tate Modern with this thematic hang, one of the reasons we did the thematic hang is that we wanted to get away from uh, the stranglehold of a rather poor quality collection that had been acquired around a kind of canon of modern and contemporary art written by Alfred Barr in America to suit the 1930s. And it felt like at the beginning of a new century just to tell the story of art in America and Europe through a focus on abstraction and a kind of formal uh, ideas of kind of like form rather than subject matter was the wrong thing to do. And so we wanted to kind of like break with history, not to throw history away, but to uh, and encourage people to think differently about um, art. And one of the things that then that yielded, of course, was the massive absence from the collection of art by women, uh, of art made using lenses, no photography, very little film, um, and no art by artists from outside Western Europe and North America. So as uh, director of the International Collection, my kind of like... Uh, vision really was to take uh, that uh, brief and begin to bring in art from other parts of the world that would challenge the kind of western narrative and do so in a, a really dynamic and expansive way uh, to address the fact that you know Britain is an extraordinary international uh, community and that almost no British art in the 20th and 21st centuries has been made without very strong conversation and networks with international artists. So, uh, and we were able to do that. I was talking to uh, 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 a colleague from uh, associated with First Sight earlier because it was possible in 2006 and 2007 to have a meeting with a patron, a lunch. And as coffee arrived, I could say to that person, whether they were from Bangladesh uh, or uh, uh, Mexico uh, or Poland, I could say, I wouldn't be doing my job if at this moment I didn't ask you to step up and join our new committee of Eastern European collectors. And we, there was a moment where you, we could just suddenly bring on and develop this fantastic uh, support network, um, which really helped... Uh, generate uh, this collecting activity at, at a moment in time where the state support, government support, was beginning to just diminish. Uh, but that trajectory has gone and on, really, 
And so we feel at this moment in time where it is m the landscape for fundraising is more and more fraught, it's a high-risk venture to challenge the kind of honeypots like the blockbusters. So there's huge nervousness at a place like Tate and across the sector in, in breaking with, with that convention, but there's also a huge appetite and interest in how we might do it because of the, the yields to uh, our audiences and to ourselves and colleagues if we were able to do that. So all that said, there was like a welter of questions thrown up by your remarks. I wanted to ask you, so it sounds like you wouldn't want to be fully funded by the government, and yet you're hinting that perhaps there are the calls of these numerous stakeholders, many of which are corporations or just the consumer in general, have become too um, exigent and threaten to, well, they, they, they almost force you into a corner to do these blockbusters for financial reasons. What is the right, what is, where is the middle ground? What is the right balance? Well, I think one of the things that I've been trying to do slowly and almost invisibly is shift our definition of the blockbuster into something else. As blockbusters were conventionally associated with high name recognition, early 20th century, great. So, you know, we know Picasso and Van Gogh, uh, Matisse are, are the biggest blockbusters of Tate's recent history. But it's quite clear that the public, and particularly a younger public, have a huge appetite for what I might call zeitgeist shows. So, uh, between the, Life Between the Islands at Tate Britain, around the Caribbean yes. recently, Soul of a Nation at Tate Modern three or four years ago, which looked at African-American uh, art. And, and, and their relationship to civil rights movements are proving really extraordinary draws. And then the, the, another type of exhibition that we've found, again, uh, can, can yield very significant audiences without the, the celebrity name, are what I would call uh, immersive or participatory experiential exhibitions like Oliver Eliasson. So there is a possibility that we can begin to, and, and the, the, the results of doing those shows have been very reassuring to people who are very, very nervous about moving away from the, block, from, from the familiar names. I mean, the other thing that I think I'm really excited about doing, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and I think you know, we have a Cezanne show coming up, and Cezanne is still such a hugely important artist for artists. And so I think one of the things that we can do is, is look at those kind of foundational moments of modernism. Why, are, why, are those, why do those audiences have such enduring appeal? But think of them very differently and, and try and therefore build a new audience for them. So it's a sort of balancing act between continuing with those names but doing them in really fresh and interesting ways. Give us an example. Well, I'll give you an example, yeah, and yeah. I shouldn't because it's, um, uh, uh, we, we haven't announced it uh, to the public yet, and so I really would hope this is a safe place. But um, <laughs> please, uh, early, ne <laughs> early next year uh, in March, we'll be doing an exhibition of uh, uh, Mondrian and Hilma Af Klimt. And, um, oh, I feel all kind of funny when I say it because Out it loud. was... Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's personally very important to me, and it was one of those... I mean, as director, I try and be terribly collaborative or co labor itive but sometimes an exhibition comes along when I just think, we have to do it, whatever, we do it. And I managed pers to persuade Bryony Fair, who's the professor of art history at UCL, who's a, a Mondrian expert and is absolutely renowned as a kind of modernist expert. So she's somebody who's reinforced this idea of a kind of particular canonical thinking. So for her to come and work with Hilma af Klimt is really radical. Anyway, so I persuaded her that we could embark on a venture of rewilding modernism. <laughs> and what we're going to do is we're going to unpack, I hate that word, but we're going to look, <laughs> these two, two artists from very different, see, see, seemingly very different places, but who both have, make claim or could, we could claim that individually and in different places they invented abstraction. But they both have, and they're very, very different, but there's so many striking parallels in their work. For example, all their lives, they both were obsessed with flower painting. People have never really don't like Mondrian's flower paintings because they just, they seem like, how can this guy who did these, you know, who hated, the, even he hated the diagonal, it was far too <laughs> radical. But, but both, 
both their art, uh, both their practices come out of nature, observing nature. Both their practices come out of a kind of spiritualism that that time was associated with theosophy, really wacky spiritualism, but also engaged with Eastern ideas coming through Europe at that time. They both were highly cognizant of uh, scientific and technical, mechanical innovations. This is the era when the telegraph was invented, the, the telephone, the X-ray. And so what we're trying to do is put both their histories back into the ether, this kind of early 20th century extraordinary period of innovation across the arts and the sciences, and see them as products, not in the case of Hilma, just of a kind of Swedish spiritual community, and Mondra not just as a kind of proto-modernist abstraction, but that these, th these, kind of, these, are, these are powerful roots out of a really rich kind of uh, you know, ecosystem. So it's returning, actually it's opening, it's opening the whole thing up, opening up art history to, to different approaches. And for me, that's incredibly exciting. So it that could have amazing. been just Mondrian, you know, the squares, whatever, but it, it will be a different kind of Mondrian. Yeah. No, I, I think this sounds amazing because the curation is actually the center of the enterprise and yeah. it's the reason that it becomes a blockbuster, which actually is very, makes me very optimistic. I mean, I, th I think the other, th sorry, no, go ahead. The Sorry. other thing to say is that, you know, over the last, uh, building the geographical scope of the collection has also gone alongside a commitment to really committing to 50% of women in everything we do, in the collection displays and the uh, exhibitions. And slowly over a 10 year period, the numbers coming to those exhibitions slowly but relentlessly arising because suddenly people get it and they think, oh, this could be interesting. I've never heard of Dora Maar, but I think she was Picasso's. But I'll go and see it because I really enjoyed um, uh, Salwa Rue de Chouquet or I really enjoyed, um, I'm trying to think, I'm, I'm doing a blind, but you say that you build confidence around categories of artists that then people say, I'm going to enjoy this because it's a Tate modern show, so this woman's going to be a great artist. Now, um, this is just a big catch-all question. Um, so if you could, and this goes back to the first question, if you could configure a museum in a vacuum in an ideal world, how would you envision that? What would it look like, the perfect museum? I hate these sort of questions. Sorry. I was sent some notes about this, and I think you, one of them said, what's your definition of a museum? So I brought yes. the ICOM definition of a museum, which is, I'm a member of ICOM, it's taking a tortuous four years for the, the directors and, and chief curators of the world's museums to come to a definition, which is so prolix that I just think it offers no guidelines at all. But when I, when I, um, I think shortly after I was appointed, a journalist answered, uh, asked me that question and I said quite very flippantly well of course a university with a playground attached and I said that because at the time we had a playground in the turbine hall uh, the superflex playground which was the most successful uh, turbine project we've ever had in terms of draw drawing a, a, a London-based diverse audience. But at the same time, we were launching a research centre. And I, what I always had wanted to do was connect those two things, because they're so often seen as you can do one, but you can't do the other. And I think we've really done that. But I had a, got a great uh, colleague, uh, senior curator of performance, who said, yeah, it was really great, Francis, but where's the nightclub? So I think we need the university, the playground, and the nightclub. Right. On that, actually, this is an opportune moment to ask you about the incorporation of technology into a contemporary art museum, because, of course, um, not to get into blockchain at all, because there's so many rich forms of media aside from, from that. I mean, how do you see Tate, for example, bringing it into... I, I know you've already been a pioneer in that, in that, in that regard, but how do you see the modern museum evolving to well, en encompass I, that? I think that the, um, we will always follow the art and rather than uh, lead the art. So when artists want to use really, go really extraordinary technology, when artists are pushing and absorbing that 
technology into their work, as Annika Yee did in our last, last turban hall commission, where she used microwaves to power her extraordinary aerobes that then were sensitised to people's bodies so that they, could, they would chase you slowly and flutter by. So when an, when an artist adopts a technology in a really interesting and dynamic way, that's when we're interested in doing it. I don't think we're interested in technology per se, but when it, it, it's driving innovation in art practice. Of course, technology in relation to uh, our website and interpretation and facilitating all those other things is another matter. But the real innovations in the museum in relation to technology will happen through artist practice, just as the real innovations in uh, the way the museum collaborates, works with, is inspired by communities, has come through artist practice. Okay. Now, I want to, uh, because we, I said we were going to attack these questions head on, I want to read a couple of quotes, uh, going back to the role of a museum again, because no one escapes from these difficult questions, unless they kick me under the table, we can't do that. Okay, so I'm quoting the director of the National Gallery in Washington. Which, the current one? Um, Female Ms. or male? Ms. Feldman. Oh yes, current. Okay. What more important role could a museum have today than in, in attempting to ease people's pain and bring them together in a safe place for difficult conversations? Versus, I'm going to give you another quote because I think it's an important <laughs> contrast. Uh, this is from Yela Krechik. I hope I'm pronouncing their name correctly. As opposed to that art should challenge dominant forms of power, aesthetics, and violence. Now, I think Tate is very masterfully steering between those two functions, one of archival, because you said university. So when I said university, do you mean what kind of pedagogy are you, do you think it's important to bring in I, to, well, the I, to the practice? When I, when I say university, I think research is really important and knowledge and knowledge exchange. And I think, uh, I think uh, experimentation. And I think the... Uh, I hate this phrase that people, it's an American one, but I probably used it myself, that a, a museum is a safe place for unsafe ideas. <laughs> Actually, the, museums aren't very safe places because they're very, they're very porous. They are in the world. But I do think that they are spaces where art can mediate uh, some of those conversations, and artists do mediate them. And the non-verbal can be such a powerful way of... Uh, absorbing uh, knowledge of empathy, of, of, of creating that, being open, helping you open your mind to those kind of mind changes that otherwise might not be possible. Where I take issue, I think when museums set out to be places of contestation and pr debate, I think they can be very, very alienating, scary places. And the welcome is the most important thing if you want to deprivilege a place. Uh, and I, I would love to feel that Tate is a, is a welcoming place. I, I, we, a couple of years ago, uh, we worked with a Cuban activist artist called Tanya Bergera. Every year we commission an artist co to come and do a project in the Turbine Hall. And the idea is that they have an opportunity to challenge themselves and respond to the space and perhaps do something that will take their career into a, a different gear. And, uh, one of the things that Tanya wanted to do, she wanted to work very closely with a group of people living in the community so that the project would be collectively delivered. So really high risk stakes, but we went ahead with it. And um, we were able to work uh, with Tanya, via Tanya, with a number of activists who were so uh, antithetical to the Tate's position including, for example, a number of the really militant uh, climate activists who had some years earlier been the ones who'd been into the Tates, poured oil o over the floor, had chanted, get BP out. So people who, they thought of us as the enemy, and we probably thought of them in a way as the, not exactly enemy, but we, were, we, were, we lived in fear of them. And through the uh, mediation of this artist, we were all able to meet together. And five years on, they are our critical friends. And the project that they uh, did and made us 
helped, that we helped them achieve was, I think, the most radical and the most fascinating of any project. And that was that during the course of the conversation, I had to meet with them. They challenged me on every point. It was terrifying. Who is on your ethics committee? Why is it only those people? Can we be on your ethics committee? Why does your governance say this? You know, really, really. And then they said, and why are we meeting in the Blavatnik building? We want you to take the name of Len Blavatnik off this building. That's our project. And of course I thought, how can I do that? He gave us 10 million pounds, <laughs> only 18 months ago. So thinking on one's feet, I said, you, we, can't, we can't do that. I told them the reasons, we have to get real. And I said, but you can put a name on the other building, the original building. I thought, oh, will the trustees agree with me? But they did agree. They agreed, they said, well, let's do it. We'll do it for a year. And so this activist group went away with the artist, Tanya Bergera, and they elected a democratic election of local people, a local uh, community worker, Natalie Bell. Completely unknown, but absolutely stellar, inspirational, kind of the, you know, the, 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 the salt of the earth, but a really extraordinary woman who helps her on Coin Street on the South Bank. So uh, the... The, the, old, the original Tate modern building is now known as, and it's painted on the walls, the Natalie Bell building. And what was so brilliant about that project is that they, those group of artists helped me, and in due course, everybody at Tate helped us envisage why we value, and that we should value the gift of, you know, the sponsors. It's really important to have people who will help us build our buildings and run our programs, but at the same time, and of equal, if not even more value, we value community, and we value the people in our neighbourhood who, who make the thing tick and who are our friends. Now, you alluded to that particular project being very high risk because it was kind of open-ended. What is the biggest risk you've taken um, since Helming Tate Modern? that ended up being a gigantic success uh, unexpectedly or in a calculated manner, but just the biggest risk you've taken that's ended up paying off big? Or is it that? This was not on my prepared list of questions. It wasn't on your prepared no, list of questions. No, do not it, kill me. I think it probably was that. Oh, it probably <laughs> was that. Um, and uh, the best thing about it was after a year, I said, can we make this permanent? And they said, mm, mm, mm. And I said, well, at least until I step down from my role. So I really hope that when I do step down, Natalie Bell building will continue. But yeah, I think that was the biggest risk because it was, that reputationally, it was so huge. And our development team was so worried that it would undervalue, it would be seen to undervalue the contribution of people who give money. But actually, what was really so, um, what has been so thrilling is that the people who give money notice these things. I mean, the, I don't think the public do, but when you take a donor through a building, their eyes are on stalks and they're saying, oh, you've lost the Sackler's name. Hmm, but you've added so and so's name. And because it's a community of people who give. And a number of those really high net worth individuals who've walked through the building have said, hey, Who's Natalie Bell? And it's just been extreme pleasure. And I even, <laughs> a couple of months ago, uh, had a very nice lunch with one of our biggest donors and Natalie Bell. And I think they're going to do something together. Which oh, is very that's nice. a great yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great story. Now, I wanted to make sure we cover one more subject before I open the floor to questions, a, a subject which is close to both of our hearts. We've been um, perceiving or observing for the last 20 years that the art industry has been a, in a state of consolidation that's actually been accelerating so that the scene has been dominated not only by blockbuster shows and a handful of household name artists but also by art galleries commercially that there's been a, almost a bifurcation in the industry of those trying to survive and then, then maybe like let's say top 10 art galleries and then we have also the most elite museums and like let's say local regional museums really finding it hard to stay afloat. So now why do you think that's happened and what can we do about it? I mean that's a huge million dollar question but you and I talked about it and I want to, this is very, you know, we talked about it at lunch, we wanted to for sure share yeah. our thoughts on this. Well I think, I mean the, I think the, the, the art market, you know, it's the un most unregulated uh, market in the world, it offers anybody wanting to invest money extraordinary investment opportunities globally. Uh, 
and uh, and as the, uh, the you know, as the world has been globalizing, so has the art market, and of course, you know, dealers are astute and see a market. So there's been a proliferation of the most dynamic and sure-footed dealers uh, all over the world. Every city has one. I mean, there are now, I think, around or pre-COVID, around three hundred major art fairs a year in the world. In 2000, there were 50. So it's a kind of exponential growth, far in excess of the growth uh, in museums. And it has kind of led to this monoculture, not just of the type of galleries, they're all very, very similar, but also to a particular kind of art, which does tend to be produced in kind of factory-sized uh, studios by a really very, very small number of people. And I have to say, as a, um, uh, before COVID, I was an international visitor. I did a lot of traveling. I'm so bored of seeing the same Anish Kapoor and the same uh, uh, Anthony Gormley in, in, in every, uh, you know, every collector's house from uh, Singapore to uh, uh, Bucharest. Um, astonishing. Um, what we do about it, I mean, I think we... Uh, yes, I want to interject okay. something. I think that n very few people in the audience know, who are not in the art industry, the cost of actually participating in an art fair. So at Art Basel, a stand would open at 60,000 pounds approximately. Just to let you all know that if you are a Gagosian, for example, with a FET presence at a fair or one of the, to uh, or one of the top galleries, it will cost about 120,000 pounds just for the fair rental. But it, but it, it uh, which, which is, which excludes it's a whole, yes, obviously. Well, to uh, naturally exclude a huge, huge proportion of, of galleries. But it, but it also excludes the kinds of practices that most of... I don't know who's, who here went to art school or whose children went to art school, but the kind of work that is um, marketed through this network is not the kind of work that you see if you go to uh, a, an MA show at Goldsmiths. It's, it's very, very... Um, you know, it's, it's painting, it's, it's sculpture, it's, in a way it's very old-fashioned. The, 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 the range of... Uh, the ways in which the new generation of artists uh, are making art is not being supported by the system. So there's something fundamentally wrong with the system. Um, I think there is cause for hope. I mean, I think there is... It's likely that people will begin to collect less. I know museums are beginning to collect less, and museums... What museums tend to do... Uh, others tend to follow. Uh, museums are collecting less. They're supporting more performance work, more intangible work. Uh, they're working in stewardship. And I, you see, you begin to see internationally the growth of a, a generation of collectors who are beginning to collect less and support residencies, for example. But, but there is an urgency to this because and we haven't really talked about climate emergency, but the impact of what we do, uh, what we call scope three emissions, of moving these you know, juggernauts full of great big paintings and huge sculptures all over the world, 200 times in the calendar year is just astonishing. And then the carbon emissions from all those hundreds of thousands of people who go from Shanghai to Basel, uh, to London, to, to Paris, on this sort of uh, endless circuit of uh, buying and traveling is just mind-blowing and terrifying. Now, I'd like to open the floor to questions because I think that, uh, oh, Mike, go ahead. By the way, this is a question from one of our speakers last year, the filmmaker Mike Figgis. <laughs> uh, really interesting presentation. Um, you said at the very beginning, you know, asked us if we were capable of uh, sort of 360 degree change of mind. It seems to me over the last 20 years, looking at, I say, an art magazines from 2000, I was looking at the other day, and then looking at something that came out this month, that the, what the changes in the world, particularly the internet, have created a, f a fundamental um, shift in what we think is art, number one. And also the big question is, like, do we actually need it anymore? I mean, uh, uh, yes. going back to yep. the fundamental reason why one would do it in the first place, and therefore does that relegate, you know, great institutions like the one you're working for into, literally into museums, actually the curating of old stuff for, for a memory of what art used to be? Um, and in your position, how, how do you feel about what's 
and you seem very positive, but how do you feel about the art world or whatever it, whatever it is now? Because it's, it's whatever you want it to be, basically. Well, I think, it, I kind of, I think it, it always was whatever you wanted it to be, but magazines have changed. But I think an institution like the Tate re re responds to the art world and the practice of artists. So there, there, it, there is less stuff that you will see on the walls and there's more uh, experience to be had. So it will shift. And I think the danger is for museums that don't shift their behaviours to reflect the interests of artists and audiences. And therefore there will be museums that are just empty repositories of stuff on the walls. You said, for example, and, and I, I sympathise with it, that <clears throat> your budget only allows you a very small amount of, of the budget to deal with the new stuff, in a sense. Well, that's why we have to change our business models. So we need to shift from investing all our cash into the blockbuster and find room to support other activities on, on those areas. So there is... A, so when I was talking about a, a new type of blockbuster, I mean... Okay. And I, it, we could talk about this for hours, but our Cezanne show, for example, we made a Cezanne show in the 1980s. I think there were 200 paintings in it. Our Cezanne show in uh, this autumn has uh, 79 paintings in it. It'll be an absolutely beautiful show, but it won't be the blockbuster that it might have been 20 years ago, and it won't cost the equivalent. So we're shifting, and we need to shift people's expectations so that they stay longer with a smaller number of exquisite masterpieces than the charge around uh, with 300. So we're, you know, we're thinking really intelligently. We'd, for example, I shouldn't say we're thinking intelligently. That's, that sounds complacent. We're really <laughs> thinking about how to do this. We, one, of the, one of the things we have at Tate Modern this week, last 10 days, is that we have a performance by a, a Taiwanese designed, conceived by a Taiwanese artist, Li Mingwei, uh, which is called Our Labyrinth, which is, uh, over the course of uh, eight and a half hours each day, a succession of two dancers very, very slowly sweep up and, and sweep out uh, uh, a, a little hill of rice. It's the most completely beautiful, slow thing that you've ever seen, and around these dancers have been on every day, you know, 10, 20, 30, 100 people just watching. And for me, it's the most exciting thing in the world. We bought the work. What we bought is a description of it. Doesn't take up any storage, uh, has no tangible heritage, but it, it's, it's work like that by a, a living artist that are beginning to make us understand how powerful a museum can be in the future without it having to be, have you know, empty galleries full of stuff on the walls that nobody's interested in. Thank you. Very quickly, how do you see this NFT, people buying art for like... They couldn't get away from that one. NFT, I completely don't understand it. it. Uh, on it's the like... list of questions I was given, I said, don't want to talk about NFTs, don't like them, don't understand them. Um, uh, the NFTs are, are here to stay, and the blockchain technology and everything. I'm really interested to see what artists are, get, if artists are going to use the technology in a really interesting way. At the moment, they make me really nervous because their carbon emissions are terrible. And I have to say that um, I wouldn't, right now, sanction the acquisition of a very, very large work made in steel for the same reasons. We're really rethinking how we function as an organisation with sustainability is to the fore. So wait, let's see what artists do, whether they can crunch it. OK, we have time for one more question. Yes, Sonia. Sonia, is that you? Yes. Yes, Sonia. Sonia Kud Adams, she's the chief fundraiser for the Contemporary Art Museum First Sight in Colchester. So, and a friend of Francis's. I also wanted to mention that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, what I just wanted to say was the trouble is with your wonderful piece that you've just described, it lasts eight hours. I want to go to an art gallery and I get enormous, deep satisfaction 
from actually looking at a painting and or another work of art that is actually there and solid and concrete. I don't mean made of concrete, but concrete. Whereas I don't really feel I have time to go and sit there for eight hours watching this performance. So do, I... <laughs> do I feel like going to um, even watch a video for an hour. But the, well, the great thing is you don't have to because I'm going to pledge, I'm going to pledge here and now that we will continue to show great paintings that you, look at, you can look at for two minutes if you like, but we will also continue to show time-based media work. We will have performances because we have a broad and diverse audience and there are some people who actually want to sit down on the floor, just like I like sitting out on a rock on the coast, and they want to look at something that moves very slowly and tune into it. And I think that uh, the most important thing that we have to do is, is uh, uh, we not have a single target audience, but realise that the audience is as, as diverse as every single person who works in, walks in that door. And the, the, great, the great challenge and the great joy is being able to create a, a really rich mix that still has a sense of kind of dynamic coherence. And that's the challenge. Well, on that note, I also want to say that I think um, Francis is one who is masterfully navigating between these two, this, these two competing sets of demands who's able to successfully square the circle which is why I invited you here, because there are not that many who are able to do it so ably and confidently. And on that note, thank you so much thank you. for spending an hour with us today.